Before you start consuming this content in video format, please note that this video is about South Korea and South Korea only. It's not about North Korea. So any comment that justifies South Korea atrocity toward its own people by pointing to North Korea are not welcome. The world is not a debate stage and you're not a debate lord. South Korea, the land of marvelous invention, world biggest technology companies and of course the infamous K-pop music industry that has been taken the world by storm in the past years. But above all, South Korea has been the biggest example of how free market and neoliberal policy can create an economical miracle. And how that is amazing. Or at least, this is what we have been fed up in the past few decades. But. Is it true though? Is South Korea such a heaven to which we all should strive to? Or did South Korea just prove that neoliberal policies are nothing more than smoke and mirrors? That in long term, they create more harm than good? In the past years, a new Korean phenomenon has been taking over the world. Korean cinema, which coming out from this marvelous liberal wonderland, you have expected to praise liberalism and capitalism. But I have been trying to tell us a completely different story about South Korea, a much darker and probably much closer to the true story. From the Squid Games to Parasite, South Korea authors have been telling a horror story in which the main monster is the capitalist society. Still, despite the popularity of those forms of art in the West, we still perceive South Korea as a prosperous country, a liberal democracy, which is its problem, but not very bad after all. Especially when compared to its northern neighbor. I decided to take a deep dive into the South Korean myth and try to understand what it's all about. I'll be honest, what I found was not only surprising but also a bit shocking and sad. So let's start this by taking a very small dive into the South Korean history. From 1910 till 1945, Korea was occupied by Japanese. It was literally a colony of Japan. Japan occupied Korea primarily for economic reasons, as Korea was seen as a source of valuable resources and a potential market for Japanese goods. During the colonial period, Japan exploited Korea natural resources such as coal, iron and timber, and used Korea labor to develop infrastructure and industry in Japan. Korea also became an important market for Japanese goods, which helped to stimulate the Japanese economy. Japan colonization of Korea was marked by brutal repression, forced labor and cultural suppression, and this action caused immense suffering for the Korean people. Basically, Japan went into a full European mode. Many Koreans were conscripted into forced labor and the Japanese government confiscated land and property from Koreans. The exploitation of Korean resources and labor also led to environmental degradation and economic and development. Japan occupation of Korea ended with the defeat in the World War II, and Korea was subsequently divided into two separate states, North Korea and South Korea. Basically, both countries were artificially made by the big boys to function as buffer zone, being one financed by the USSR and the other one financed by the US. As a result, the US appointed and supported South Korea's first dictator, a right-wing nationalist, Sigma Rhe. Under rare leadership, South Korea government was committing numerous human rights violations, including torture, political repression, and forced relocation of civilians. The US government continued to support the Rhe regime despite his allegation, viewing him as a crucial ally in the fight against Communist Soviet Union. The scale of this repression were massive and brutal, mainly if you look at the size of the country, its population, and the fact that it just got out of the Japanese occupation. There are countless examples of atrocities committed by the South Korea government toward its citizens in order to suppress any left-wing movement. We even have examples where entire villages, including women and children, were executed by suspicions of being communist sympathizers. But still, one of the biggest and most influential will be the Jeju Uprising. The Jeju Uprising was a major rebellion that took place in South Korea island of Jeju from 1948 till 1954. The uprising was a result of political tension in the country following the division of Korea into two separate states after World War II. The uprising began on April 3, 1948, when the police opened fire in a peaceful demonstration in Jeju City, the island capital. This sparked a wave of protest and violence that quickly 
spread across the island. The rebels were mainly farmers, laborers, and other marginalized groups who opposed policy of the South Korea government and its military force. In response, the South Korea government deployed tens of thousands of troops to Jeju, along with the police paramilitary force. They launched a brutal counter-insurgency campaign that included the killing of suspect rebels and their family. Mass arrests and detention, torture, and other human rights abuses were made. The exact number of casualties from the uprising is not known, but estimates range from 20,000 to 60,000 people killed, with tens of thousands more injured or imprisoned. Almost 20 years after this rebellion was extinguished, any mention of this within South Korea could get you imprisoned. The mass political repression supported by the US resulted in absolute power held by the Sin Man Rae, especially after the Korean War. A war which I'll not touch in this video, it's a very complicated topic that deserves a video of its own. So with full support from the USA, its ideologues and its massive subsidies, South Korea started to implement capitalism. And please, don't overestimate the USA contribution to this new Korea. For almost a decade, the majority of South Korea government budget consisted only out of USA subsidies. At that time, South Korea was a typical capitalist Wild West. Majority of Korean most famous companies were established the way we know them then. And what many forget to mention is that the majority of those companies were founded or directly connected to the South Korea regime, benefiting in form of subsidies that allowed them to grow and expand. And everything was going kind of fine, except for population, who still, in many cases, suffer from extreme condition of poverty, growing inequality, which once again led to a popular uprising and discontent. This massive discontent, political persecution and corruption led to what now is known as April Revolution. In April of 1958, student protests broke out in the city of Masan, calling for democratic reforms and an end to res rule. The protest quickly spread to other cities and soon became a nationwide movement. The government responded with violent repression using tear gas, water cannons and batons to disperse the protests. Many students and other protests were arrested and tortured. By some estimates, around 1,000 people were killed by police and military forces. Despite the government's effort to suppress the protest, they continued from 1958 and into 1959, eventually leading to Rae's resignation in April of 1960. Also, it's important to mention that after South Korea dictator was forced to resign, he was flew out of the country by the CIA and would spend the rest of his days in Hawaii, chilling under the sun. At this point, South Korea finally had gotten some possibility to gain some freedom, with a very optimistic possible future. There was only one small problem. More and more people started to show left-wing ideals, and even desire reunification of Korea Peninsula which was very appealing by a grand part of the population, mainly to the fact that at the time, the North was much better off in terms of life quality than the South. As you might imagine by now, the US would never allow that to happen. So in 1961, General Park Chu He, head of the military junta, backed by USA, seized power in a military coup, destroying any possibility of political freedom of expression for the Korean people until almost the 90s. Inspired by a new and almost unknown ideology, but we now call neoliberalism, the South Korean dictator decided to conduct a new and very specific economical reform. The economic reform of the 1960s and 70s were closely tied to the country's large, wealthy conglomerates, known as chobos, many of whom were created and proliferated in the 50s with the support of the previous dictatorship. Under the junta government, the chobos were given professional treatment in terms of access to credit, subsidies and other forms of government support, like existence of the military in putting down strikes and discontent. This allowed them to expand rapidly and dominate the country's economy. Basically, the South Korean government gave full control of the country's riches to these corporations, that were basically run by families to do whatever they wanted, with only one mission, to grow as much as possible. It is also important to mention that the massive growth in this corporation is also due to even bigger subsidies given to South Korea by the USA, mainly after the beginning of the Vietnam War. By the 1970s, a handful of chobos, including Samsung, LJ and Hyundai, had become some of the largest and most powerful corporations in the world. And despite the fact that the military junta changed leaders several times, these companies always continued in their privileged position. The close relation between the government and the chobos created a system of chronic capitalism, where a small group of wealthy families and their business had significant influence over the country's economy and political system. This system 
led to widespread corruption as the government official and business leaders often colluded to enrich themselves at the expense of the broader population. It would be unfair to say that the general population did not benefit from it. They did. The quality of life started to increase very much, but by saying that doesn't negate the fact that still the South Korean population was being still ripped off by those companies, which many people realized. And that resulted in massive opposition. Labor unions, for example, organized strikes and protests against poor working conditions and low wages in a country that was rapidly industrializing. Those same labor unions faced significant government pressure and, and harassment, with union leaders being arrested, imprisoned, or forced into hiding. In some cases, the government dissolved unions altogether and banned labor protests. In addition to using force against protesters and unions, the government also implemented strict laws and regulations to limit political dissent and restrict the activities of opposition groups. This included censorship in the press and media and new surveillance and secret police to monitor and suppress political activity. Despite that, the political opposition still managed to survive. So in 1972, the government declared a national emergency and enacted a series of measures to suppress political opposition and dissent. This period of repression is known as Yushin Constitution Era and saw the arrest and detention of thousands of activists, journalists and intellectuals, many of whom were tortured and subject to brutal interrogation. Even that was not enough to completely suppress the Korean people. And so, in 1980s, we had what is now known as Ganju Uprising, in which citizens of the city of Guangzhou rose up against the military dictatorship and, of course, was brutally suppressed by the government, resulting in deaths of hundreds of civilians, mainly students and union members. Basically, till the 90s, we had a government who suppressed the hell out of its people, while simultaneously massively benefiting corporations. And despite the fact that technically South Korea is not under dictatorship right now, at least not in the traditional form, the symbiosis between these companies and the government still exists in the same capacity that existed during the military junta occupation. After 1993, when Korea's first civil president was elected, a new wonderful wall opened in front of many Koreans. Its industry were booming, export level all-time high, and Western investment also at all-time high. And everything looked wonderful at least for the government class and big business, which at this point, if we're not the same, we're in a very strong symbiosis. But then, the Asian 1997 crisis happened. The Asian financial crisis of 1997 hit South Korea particularly hard, causing a sharp drop in the country's economic growth and leading to high levels of unemployment, which despite it being a very big crisis, South Korea managed to recover very quickly. Many of you do many through two important factors. The first one was a very big, big loan from the IMF, which mainly once again went to South Korea big companies and banking system. And the second factor was a massive working reform, which damaged an already weakened working class even harder. One of the main ways in which the reform damaged the working class was through the expansion of non-regular employment, such as part-time and temporary work. With these reforms, basically, by changing definitions, the state and companies were able to take many securities, benefits and rights from the working people. These reforms contributed to widely income gap and greater job insecurity for many workers and even remain a continuous issue in South Korea politics and society today. Very often, we hear about how prosperous South Korea is, how an amazing example of Western democracy it is, and how big the GDP is. And to be honest, I don't know why at this point we still use GDP as a big measure of metric, despite that it tells nothing about anything. And we all know it at this point. And if I had to guess, the only reason we still use it as a metric is because it's beneficial for the economical status quo. But once again, who am I? So what's the state of South Korea capitalism society right now? What's going on in this marvelous liberal country? South Korea, in my opinion, is one of the best examples of a neoliberal country. A country where the only function of the government is to maintain the status quo, which mainly consists of giving massive subsidies to private sector and using its power apparatus to suppress the population. The government functions to protect those companies that are called Cheobol. Not only that, but in some cities, those companies completely overtook every role of the government. As I already tried to show several times, this inequality is systematic and has been fermenting since Korea's foundation. As a result, as a result we might have what some would call a caste class system, which in my opinion is an extreme variation of what we have here in the West. The newer generation even attributed a definition to this extreme division. Dirty spoons and golden spoons. These terms originated from the fact that young people 
who are struggling to make ends meet, are unable to afford proper meals and instead must resort to eating from unwashed spoons in convenience stores or other public areas, despite nowadays it mainly being used as a class differentiator between kids who have rich parents and kids who don't have rich parents, which in South Korea society literally translates into having or not having life opportunity. Dirty spoons in South Korea is a clear example of a failure of neoliberal economic policies that prioritize the interests of the wealthy and powerful over those of ordinary working people and how those policies destroy any possibility of class mobility. The issue of dirty spoons The issue of dirty spoon highlights the human cost of the inequality, as young people are forced to resort to desperate measures just to survive. And don't get me wrong, poverty and inequality are by far only affecting your own population. According to World Bank, South Korea has the highest level of poverty amongst people older than 65 across the world. In today's South Korea, many people are struggling to make ends meet and are highly indebted. According to Korean National Bank, Every 12 minutes, someone in South Korea goes bankrupt. The costs of living are high, wages are stagnant, and the government doesn't want to address those growing inequality and poverty in any significant way. At the same time, corruption and cronyism are widespread, with many powerful figures using their wealth and influence to secure political power and protect their interests. This has led to a growing sense of frustration and disillusionment among ordinary people, who feel that their voices are not being heard by those in power. All that, all that resulting not only in a very bad living condition, but in a very high suicide rate and very low fertility rate among the, its population. All of it as a result of neoliberal reforms and a high dominance from the part of these chobol monopolies that control every aspect of Korean society. So let's talk a little bit more about this chobol. Chobols are powerful and exploitive monopolies that perpetuate social and economic inequality in South Korea. They have a significant influence on the country's economy, politics, and culture. Chobol uses their wealth and power to maintain the dominance and suppress competition, which leads to lack of innovation and stagnant economy. Additionally, Chobol have been accused of exploiting the workers, engaging in corrupt practices, and damaging the environment. Chobols are symbols of an oppressive capitalist system that needs to be dismantled in order to create a more just and equitable society. Despite the fact that they are trying to be sold as companies that are not just business entity, but also symbols of national pride and identity, which is kind of what the Germans and Italians did last century. Not only do they control every aspect of Korean life, but they force a very toxic and damaging culture through the different instruments available to them. They force prevalence of long working hours, which at this point legally is at 52 and soon could be raised to 69. This leads to burnout, stress, and a health problem for the worker. A high pressure to work overtime is often a result of intense competition among business and pressure to increase productivity that's seriously damaging the worker's life. All of this, in addition to the lack of protection for the worker's right to organize and bargain collectively. Unionization rates are relatively low in South Korea and there are often barriers to organizing, such as legal restriction and employer's opposition. And when the workers do manage to organize and fight back, the government steps in on the side of the corporation with its military apparatus. In some cases, not only dispersing the demonstration, but forcing the workers to pay the company all the possible monetary damage that they cause to the company. Despite these challenges, labor unions in South Korea have remained active and vocal, starting regular strikes and protests to demand better working conditions, higher wages and more job security. In recent years, there have been a number of high-profile strikes, including the national, nationwide railroad strike in 2016 and a series of strikes by the public sectors in and a series of strikes by the public sector in 2019. However, the government has responded to this action with force, using police and legal measures to suppress union activities and arrest union leaders. South Korea is a country of many things, but one thing it's for sure, a neoliberal hell for the majority of people who live there, is a country where people are in constant struggling for survival, where wage slavery is at its most extreme example, a place where traditional slavery is thriving, where a few families control all cultural resources and impose a homogeneity to the rest of society. Despite that, South Korea people didn't stop to fight, despite almost half a century of repression politically and economically. To be honest, I don't know what I could say more about this topic, despite having the feeling that's a lot more to be said. 
I highly encourage you to see for yourself, to read for yourself. There's a lot of content available online exploring this topic in different ways. South Korea is an extreme example of what liberalism could be, or at least that's what I like to think. Because the other option is a lot more scary. The other option is that South Korea is just a prophecy of what awaits us all if we continue to live under this system. Thank you for watching to this point and if you are living in South Korea I could only wish you the strength to continue the fight. Solidarity to all and sorry for my pronunciations.